There's a lot of quality adult animated shows on every streaming service at the moment, and I could probably go on to any one and find a new show I've never even heard of before and say, hey, that's not bad. But adult animation doesn't have the best rep, often being overly crude with swearing and sex replacing comedy and story as opposed to enhancing it. But every now and then, there's a hidden gem that falls into that perfect balance where these creators can make a show for a more mature audience with a more cohesive plot in mind, or they can be more experimental with their tones and themes. Or or sometimes you have the shadow of a beloved platformer like Rayman eating sushi off of a naked woman. Anyways, today I wanted to make a video of 5 adult animated shows that you should watch. Now. Starting off, I want to talk about Agent Elvis. Agent Elvis digs deep and asks the question, what if Archer was Elvis instead? Created by Elvis' ex-wife Priscilla Presley, singer, songwriter John Eddy, and Mike Arnold, a writer from Archer, we see the king of rock and roll Moonlight as a secret agent. Joined by Scatter the Chimpanzee, who in the show, as in real life, was on that good cushion alcohol, apparently the real Scatter would lift up gals' skirts and bite people, along with the drugs and alcohol, and was just overall kind of a mess. In the show, he's played by Tom Kenny, who also voiced Spongebob, which isn't the first Spongebob and Elvis crossover, surprisingly enough. There's a lot of talented voice acting in the show, and while celebrities don't necessarily correlate with quality and animation... Don't I scare you in the least? I see weird every weekend on Sunset. Matthew McConaughey is a pretty dang good Elvis, and might be one of the highlights of the show. The premise of Agent Elvis stems from a famous photo of Elvis and Richard Nixon shaking hands in the Oval Office after Elvis wrote to Nixon asking for a federal agent's narcotic badge. Now that might sound ironic. Elvis, the rock star with multiple overdoses, asking for a narc badge. But it's an important part of Elvis' story to acknowledge that Elvis wanted to help with the war on illegal drugs, and saw himself as someone who could help influence the youth against drugs and communism and stuff. In her memoir, Elvis and Me, Priscilla says, with the federal narcotics badge, he believed he could legally enter any country both wearing guns and carrying any drugs he wished. And that's so funny to think Elvis was like, I'm joining the war on drugs, on the side of drugs. But Elvis' life serves as a grim illumination of prescription drug addiction, as his autopsy revealed a concoction of legal prescription drugs that were all properly administered to him. I might be getting a little sidetracked, but I hope this might give a little context to the surprisingly unique backdrop for a spy show to center around the war on drugs in the Cold War, but with a music icon like Elvis. The art style is really sharp, spearheaded by one of my favorite artists, Robert Valley, director of Pear Cider and Cigarettes. Elvis is always depicted as really cool, and while the show is funny, the best thing the show does is preserve the elements of Elvis as a cool, smooth, kind of badass guy. The story's a bit hit or miss, I don't care for a lot of the characters, and I'm not really invested in a lot of the plot lines, but I'd say if you like Elvis, or if you think the show looks cool from a glance, you won't be disappointed. And there's something to be said about shows that know exactly what they want to be and execute on it, which is more than what I can say about the next entry on the list, Captain Laserhawk. Captain Laserhawk is a pretty odd show, and is like some horrifying amalgamation of every Ubisoft property while at the same time being about none of them. The full name of the show is Captain Laserhawk, a Blood Dragon remix, named after Far Cry 3, Blood Dragon, but truthfully, I don't know much about the correlation between the two, and I've never played Far Cry. Apparently they both capture the 80s retro futuristic cyberpunk apocalypse vibes. The show centers around Dolph Laserhawk, a super soldier who seeks to destroy the manipulative Eden Corporation, who actually saved his life when he was on the brink of death. Eden's kind of like your typical overlord, like this propaganda movie is required watching. If you don't, there's a fine of 500 UB credits. You know, cause like, UB credits like Ubisoft, I guess. And the news anchor in this world is Rayman? Honestly, Rayman is the most interesting part of the show. He's pretty funny and does a whole slew of roles from talk show host to news anchor to kid show singer, eventually going into a downward spiral of drugs and alcohol alcohol, among other things. There's a few plot lines, like there's these animal cyborgs that were created in a lab and like a whole race war between them and the citizens of Eden. And then there's the story between Dolph and his former lover slash partner in crime Alex, and they're both kind of trying to start the revolution but disagree on how to do it. The story's full of betrayal and romance and revenge, and it's an interesting concept for sure. Like you don't often see a James Bond-esque mission where the partners betray each other and have romance, especially with a same-sex couple 
couple, but the show doesn't really give me any reason to care about the characters or to root for them. Like, I'm often just confused when watching it. But with only six episodes for the season, I can't help but think most of these story and character issues may have to do more with budget and production than anything else. The animation is pretty great though, and of all the entries on the list, this would be my top pick in that regard. So if you're looking for a show with a nice art style, some queer romance plot lines, and Rayman, give it a watch. It's only six episodes for better or worse, and with the showrunner from Netflix's Castlevania running it, who knows what it can turn into if given more time in a new season. Next up we have Scavenger's Reign. Based on the 2016 short film, Scavenger's Reign is a very atmospheric sci-fi adventure that tells the story of these three groups of characters marooned on a foreign planet. As they try to find their way back to the escape pod, they have to avoid the countless dangers from the creatures around them. The ability to start a story without a lot of context and exposition is definitely an aspect I attribute more to adult animation, so it's really interesting to see and try and piece together who these characters are and why they're here, or what their relations are to the other characters. The tone and direction of the show is great, it's full of tension and drama, but I also feel inexplicably relaxed while watching it. I get a lot of vibes from my favorite Miyazaki movie, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, from the vehicles and technology to the creature designs, and how how they interact with the nature around them. You know those videos where Studio Ghibli characters are preparing food and it's like the most satisfying thing you've ever seen? This show captures a similar vibe, but with these elaborate fictional animals interacting with the flora and fauna around them. I find myself equally invested trying to figure out how this ecosystem works as I am invested in these characters and their plot lines. This is a series I don't hear people talk about too often, and I think I found out about it from seeing the breakdowns of the compositing from a compositing artist on the show, Axel Alvarez, who you can find on Instagram at axinmotion one The show is very pretty and it really excels in the compositing and backgrounds. I'd totally recommend it for not only being a great looking show, but it has a captivating story that has me full fully invested, with a fantastic pace, and knows exactly when to slow things down and let us sit with the characters or even the nature for a minute. I've already talked about Carol in the End of the World, so feel free to check out my last video on it, but to quickly mention it without any spoilers, Carol in the End of the World is a show about the impending end of the world from the perspective of a dull, deadpan woman who instead of using her final months alive to travel the world, finds comfort working in an office and going to Applebee's for some dollaritas after. It really goes into the deeper aspects of the purpose of life and the subtle sensibilities of the world around you and the bonds you make, and each episode feels like a half hour Poem. It's pretty funny and I like all the characters. I describe it as The Office meets Majora's Mask, so take that as you will. Carol is played by Martha Kelly, aka Martha, from the HBO show Baskets, and if you've ever seen it, you'll know exactly what you're getting yourself into here, as so many moments in the show are funny and sad, and just give you a bittersweet smile, like, you know what, maybe it's not all gonna be okay. And that's okay! I think a lot of people either love it or hate it, some people think it's very deep and profound, others think it's a drab pretentious mess they can't understand. I don't think it has to be that polarizing, I personally say you should check it out, and stick with it because it's such a unique premise from its main character to its casting to the plot of the show. Who knows when we'll get a show like this again. And the final show I want to talk about today is Fired From Mars. Fired From Mars is definitely the biggest surprise of any of the shows on this list. I haven't heard many people talk about it, but people online plead everyone to watch it, and I did, and it was as great as they said. It follows Jeff Cooper, a graphic designer for this corporate Mars colonization project. He struggles to maintain his long distance relationship with his girlfriend back on Earth, and then he gets fired from his job as a graphic designer, leading Jeff to search for his purpose, 222 million million miles away from Earth. Okay, I didn't really think Mars was that far away. This is giving me more of an existential crisis than Carol. The direction of the show is top tier, with great drama and tension. It's uneasy not being able to fully grasp the power of the facility and the Mars Corporation elites. Like, who knows what dark secrets they're trying to bury, while at the same time, there's hilarious moments throughout, like Jeff going crazy and labeling everything, from the already labeled elevator numbers and coffee cups, to setting up a party for his new boss with supplies from around the colony and a room full of laughing gas. I still think about the room full of hay with utter balloons slowly sinking down. 
The tone of the show leads to a lot of humor stemming from the subtext and absurdity of the scenarios rather than joke after joke, which does lead to some people finding it boring or annoying. The show is often compared to the likes of BoJack Horseman as a modern animated show that focuses on the character studies and development as much as it does the absurdity and humor of the situations they get into. The art style is very grounded, and you can see the influences of more down-to-earth, no pun intended, adult comedies like King of the Hill. The creators say in an interview they were inspired by Mike Judge's grounded designs, and it makes sense for a story that's equally about the degrees of corporate disenfranchisement as it is a sci-fi adventure. This art style might not draw a lot of people in initially, as it deviates from a lot of modern stylistic properties. Like, you don't usually see faces with a lot of lines on them, or a nose separated into four or five individual tangents. There's not a lot of shading or texture, and the character proportions are pretty basic. But I think it all works really well together. The sci-fi elements come out more in the backgrounds of the show, with the team referencing the 1995 anime short Magnetic Rose, part of the Memories anthology. It was written by the legendary director of Paprika and Perfect Blue, Satoshi Kon, and produced by the director of Akira, Katsuhiro Otomo. This influence makes sense when you see the painterly textures of the backgrounds combined with the expansive scale inside and outside of the facility. And the animation is really competent, with great shot selections that add to the subtle buildup of the story. There's a scene at the end of the first episode where Jeff escapes from getting put in a freeze tank, and there's just a nice rhythm and quality, like we see Jeff's body pillow arm thing is under the stretcher, and if you're paying attention, you'll notice it from earlier in the episode. Cut to a missing spacesuit on the security monitor, and we see Jeff at the edge of the facility. It's a nice way to direct the scene instead of someone saying, what, a spacesuit is missing? And, oh, that must be Jeff, where is he? And the whole show is full of moments like this that reward you for paying attention and finding these details for yourself. Also, this scene of the boss playing golf with a robot he controls kills me every time. So yeah, I totally recommend Fired from Mars, it's a great watch I could compare to things like BoJack or Breaking Bad, and it's a show I rarely hear people talk about that definitely deserves more views. So hopefully from this video you found your next show to check out. I'd love to know what shows you liked or disliked, and if there's other shows I should check out for a part 2 sometime. Make sure to like and subscribe so you can see when I make more videos on the shows you want to see, and I'll talk to you next week. Bye.